Hi everyone, in this video I'll be explaining Advent of Code 2021, Day 17. As usual, the code is in the description and I'll be explaining both puzzles in detail. The story is, we are in a large ocean trench and we want to find the keys, which might be inside. To do that, we have to send in a probe, and this probe is going to be fired from a cannon with a given velocity, and we want it to land in a target range. The velocity of the probe is affected by several forces, one of which is gravity, which decreases the y velocity, and drag, which decreases the x velocity. Specifically, every step, these four things happen. X position increases by X velocity, Y position increases by Y velocity, as we would expect. And then the X velocity decreases towards zero. Um, so decreasing if it's positive and increasing if it's negative. And then the Y velocity decreases by one due to gravity. So you can see this image, the probe kind of goes in a parabolic arc, but with some drag. A caveat which actually makes the puzzle easier is that when we're considering the motion of the probe, we don't want to consider any points in between different steps. So if the probe looks like it's going to go through the target area, but it doesn't actually like step through it on any step, then we don't count that as passing through the target area. The question is, we want to make the probe pass through the target area, but with as high a Y velocity as possible because we are cool. So how I solved this puzzle was using a lot of functions. And these functions are useful for making the code more concise and easier to read. So I have here four functions. The first function is just the iteration step. It's exactly what is explained in the puzzle. Given a previous position and a velocity, we want to compute the next position and velocity. And it literally just does what the puzzle wants it to do. And then I have a, another function which detects whether a position is within the target area just for convenience. We could put this like ad verbatim in wherever we need it, but this is just easier in my opinion. And then we have another function which describes whether the probe is, is past the target area already and whether it's ever going to reach it ever again. We can do this by, let's consider the target area as a rectangle and our probe is a little dot with a vector on it, which is not a force, but rather a velocity. So in this configuration, the probe has not reached the target area yet, and it might. But in this configuration, um, the probe is past the target area. Here's another example. Um, the probe is here. It has not passed the target area yet. And here's another example. The probe has not passed the target area yet. Here's another one. Um, the probe has passed the target area. So we can notice a trend. We just need to consider the boundaries of the target area. Let's first go for Y velocity. If we know this is the bottom edge of the target area, we want to consider the Y position of the probe. If the Y position is above, then we know it might land in the target area at some point, but we know definitely that if the probe is already below the bottom of the target area and it's going down, it's never going to reach it. So that is this if clause in here. If the Y velocity is negative and it's already below the target area, then we know it's never going to hit it ever again. Now, considering x velocity, this is slightly more complicated, but we just consider the left and the right boundaries of the target area. If a probe is to the left and it's traveling left, then it's not going to hit the target area. And if it's to the right and it's traveling right, then it's not going to hit it ever again. So that's what this code does. Um, if a velocity is positive and it's already to the right, or if it's negative and already to the left, then it's never going to hit. So there's three cases in which case in which we know that the probe is never going to reach the target area ever again. Now this fourth function it computes. This is really the crux of the puzzle. It computes whether, given a starting velocity, the probe will hit the target. So we are given that the probe starts at position is zero zero, and we want to find, given a velocity, does this probe hit the target at some point? And here's where all the functions come in. First of all, we initialize our position and the max y velocity because that's what we're trying to, oh, sorry, the max y position because that's what we're trying to find in the puzzle. While the probe still has a possibility of hitting the target, we want to first update the maximum y because that's our answer. And if the probe does hit the target, then boom, we found a starting velocity that does work. Therefore, we can return true along with the max y position. Um, and if it doesn't hit the target, then we just keep stepping through. And at some point, it's going to travel either past the target area or it's going to hit the target area. And so this will terminate eventually. And now we just use this very well-written function to do a bunch of y-coordinates and 
sorry, Y velocities and X velocities, test which ones work, and find the maximum Y position reached. Now, a challenge in doing this is we have to know which Y velocities to search, because we can't just search from, like, negative a million to a million. That's going to be way too slow. So, I actually did do that for the X velocity, for a range from negative 100 to positive 100, because I didn't want to do some, like, math integration stuff to see if a velocity will hit or not hit the target, so... I just did this, I was lazy, and it worked, so I assume um, this is going to be good enough for all inputs. Now, Y velocities are more tricky because we want the highest Y velocity possible because intuitively, you know, you want to have a high Y velocity to reach a high, high Y position. Um, hopefully that makes sense to you. Now, what do we know about the minimum possible Y velocity? So let's say we're starting at zero, zero, and the target area is below us. Then we know that our y velocity cannot possibly be greater than this distance over here. Because if it's like, if it's going down, then after the first step, I mean, if it's going down and after the first step, it's already below the target area, then we don't want to consider this y velocity at all. That's why we have this, uh, actually, I did not include it here. I included it in part two. But, um, yeah, if the y velocity is... If it ever goes below the bottom of the target so that on the first step it just goes out of bounds, then we want to stop because all future Y velocities after that are going to be bad. Um, I should note we are ranging from maximum Y velocity to minimum, so going from like 100 to negative 100 because we want the maximum possible first. And now we want to consider what's the maximum Y velocity that we could possibly reach. Well, I'm going to argue that it's the exact opposite. It's going to be going up in this direction the same amount. So this is x, this is also x. This is the max y velocity. Now, why is this true? No pun intended. Consider a parabola. We're sort of traveling in a parabola, um, but not really parabola because there's drag. But for the y coordinate over time, it is going to be a parabola. And note that parabolas are symmetric. So if you look at the y velocity at the start here and at the end here, as long as they're on the same vertical position, they're going to be exact opposites of each other. So we can prove this using some, some I guess, calculus or whatever, but intuitively you know this is true because if a ball goes up at 10, 10 meters per second, then when it comes down and it hits the ground, it's also going to be 10 meters per second, ignoring air um, resistance. You can also prove this using energy or whatever. Um, physics is cool. So that's the argument for why our y velocity can be at most this distance from zero to the bottom of the target. Because when it comes crashing down, it's going to be the same exact situation as initially. When it comes crashing down, we don't want it to be already shooting past the target at a speed that will miss it entirely. So that's why the maximum y velocity starts at most this distance. So now we have a range for our y velocities, and we also have a range for our x velocities. Uh, which was just, you know, guessed. And for every single one of them, we find whether this starting pair of x and y velocities will hit the target. If it does, then we want to add on the maximum y value. Um, and we know that this maximum y value, the first one that we consider, is going to be the maximum, because again, we are considering y velocities from decreasing order. Therefore, the first one we reach is going to be the maximum. Okay, I kind of repeated myself there a bit, but that's fine. Okay, for part two, we realize that shooting the probe the highest is perhaps not the best idea because we don't want our probe to be destroyed, right? So we want to consider instead all the possible starting velocities that will make the probe hit the target. So we can reuse a lot of our code from part one. These four functions are going to stay the exact same except we can actually remove this part about computing the maximum y value. We just need to know if a starting velocity is going to hit the target or not. And literally, we can use the same code. Um, we know our y range, we know our x range. For every single velocity, we just compute whether it hits the target or not, and if so, then we increment our answer by one. So it's literally the same as part one, just with a bit of modification to what we're actually trying to find. So you can see, switching between the code, these look the exact same. All right, so the code, again, will be on the GitHub repository, which is linked to in the description. I hope you enjoyed today's puzzle, and I hope you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow for day 18. Thanks for watching.